is work ethic. Nobody works harder than Rafael Nadal. He is, I'm sure you'll, I don't need to convince any of you here, but really he's, uh, he's a class above the rest when it comes to detail, discipline, and just being able to be relentless over and over again. So in the workplace or in the corporate world, what we're thinking and what we're talking about here is discretionary effort. And now the challenge that we all face in a world where we're moving forward to this new normal, as we spoke about, is how do you breed this in a work from home environment? So when we get to our tactics, I'll be sharing one or two things around that. Uh, but I think it is something for us to think about, something for us to consider when it comes to the work ethic of the people that within our organisations and their discretionary effort and how we we breathe that and nurture that within this, this new environment. So work ethics, number one. Number two, purpose. Roger Federer, the GOAT, we mentioned him earlier, okay, doesn't do anything unless it's on purpose, being connected to the purpose. I know in my coaching philosophy, in, in chapter two anyway, I certainly don't do anything unless I know my purpose. I need to feel connected to my purpose. Not too dissimilar, of course, in the workplace, think alignment and contribution. Our employees need to really think about, do I feel like I'm engaged with my work that uses my skills and my capabilities? And do I understand how I contribute to the business goals? Because at the end of the day, if I don't believe um, that I know how I actually connect to the bigger purpose then why would I stay within an organisation? So purpose, alignment, contribution, so, so important. Traits of champions, traits within the workplace. Number two, purpose. Number three, belief. There it is. There's my little ball again. Believe and what we're talking about here, I'll, I'll touch on Victoria as a ranker first. So I had the opportunity when Australia was playing Belarus and Victoria was 12 playing in the 14 world's championships and she'd gone on and she'd beaten our number one player and my number two player was four one up in the first set they were winning four one and as a ranker uh after my player had done three double faults in a row at four one up and she went to the side of the fence she put her arms on the side of fence and she said bella 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 roosh 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 and i was, I was like looking down going who who is this girl? Oh, it's that number one girl was and as a, as a ranker or something like that. And she had such belief and such passion and such deep desire to, to win and believe that she could win and that believe that she would do anything for Belarus. It was, it was a, a moment in time that I'll actually never forget. And I loved seeing her come back after being a mum and, and have that belief again, which was really awesome to see in, in uh, the U S open last year. In the workplace, we need to think about work engagement. So the higher the work engagement, the more you believe in the mission and the vision and is the mission and the values connected with your values. I do so much work with values uh, within companies, within sporting teams, and the values, as we saw with Uber, have to be aligned. You have to believe in them. And the stronger the engagement, the higher the productivity, the higher the retention, and no doubt the more profitable the company. So this trait cannot be underestimated. All right, I mentioned earlier, trait number four is going to be one of the most important traits 2022, 2023, moving into the future. I know you're all on the edge of your seat. So before I give it to you, who can tell me what was trait number two. First person in the chat box, what was trait number two? Da -da -da, ting. Good job, everybody. Purpose. All right, number four is, starts with R, does anyone want to have a guess? Resilience. Now, if we think about tennis for a moment, let's start with that. And we think about uh, some stats. This is from about five years ago, but it still holds very true today. Um, both uh, Federer and Serena finished world number one. They had won a ridiculous amount of matches in that year. It was something in the 90s. I can't quite exactly remember. 
but they'd won, let's say, uh, 92% of all their matches for the year. Here's, here's the really interesting thing about tennis. How many points out of 100% do you think that they lost? So they've won all these matches, but how many points did that mean that they had won versus lost? So in the chat box, have a guess out of 100%. So let's start with how many points that they won, how many points they won. So they won all these matches for the year. They finished world number one by the end of the year's rankings. How many points did they win out of a percentage? And have a go, how many points they lost? I'll reveal that answer in a minute. I'll give you five more seconds. Just have a go, remember? You can't get it wrong because taking action is more important than anything in this world. Have a go. All right, so they actually won 55% of all points, 55%, which of course means that they lost 45% of all points. Tennis, make no mistake about it, teaches life lessons because you have to, you have to experience micro moments of resiliency. You have to basically come second almost every second point. You win a point, you lose a point. You win a point, you lose a point. If you dwell on that, then, of course, what's going to happen? Downward spiral. You have to get over yourself quickly. And whether I'm working with a player or in the workplace, one of the strategies that we use is just called the snap technique. So just lifting it up. Yep, it's okay. I'm a, For three seconds, yep, I'm allowed to be disappointed in myself. Bam, snap it down. Say the word stop helping you then to realign with your anchor and your affirmation to move forward to what it is that you want. You can be tough on yourself, but in an empowering way and it's strengthen that, that inner voice. We know that Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, two incredible athletes going through some difficult times. Resiliency, doesn't matter if it's in the sporting world or in the corporate world, is something both on the court, off the court, on the field, off the field, uh, that we experience, that we all go through. So this is just a micro little technique. And we obviously have a lot of macro techniques as well to help build resi resiliency. Because in the workplace, I know that there's a lot of time spent measuring stress. And with that stress, the question is, do I believe that the amount of stress that I experience is reasonable for me in the role that I'm doing. And if it's not, then this is directly linked to my intent to stay. So even if I have high work engagement and I feel aligned to the purpose, I have pride in the organisation, I have a high score on relating to the mission and the values, there is a direct correlation between the level of stress that your, the workforce experiences or the, or the person experiences and their intent to stay. So that there directly relates to the champion quality of resiliency. What other strategies can we use? Well, I've often been told that I am potentially the female version of Ted Lasso, minus the moustache, of course. And uh, so let's all uh, enjoy this little clip and let me know in the chat box if you are a Ted Lasso fan, but another micro resiliency technique coming up right here. You know what the happiest animal on earth is? It's a goldfish. You know why? No. Got a 10 second memory. Be a goldfish, Sam. Be a goldfish. 10 second memory. Yes, it's okay to dwell on maybe something that hasn't gone well. And then, boom, future-based thinking to be able to then return to the present, execute, and deliver. It's something that I work on with my athletes, in my executive coaching. Really, future-based thinking is what I call it. So it's important, yes, that we develop these skills. And resiliency is super, super important more so than ever in the workplace today. Trait number five, the final trait is teamwork. Now, I know that I've got a picture there of the, the, um, the Brian brothers. And yes, they're a doubles team, famous doubles team. Make no mistake about it. 
often people think of tennis as an individual sport. I am here to shatter that belief. It is 100% not an individual sport. Even, even at, uh, say, a junior level, uh, maybe some of you have kids that, that play tennis and exactly that. There's the coach and, and then there's the parent that needs to practice with the kid and there's the whole team that goes into the development and putting that player at the centre of the, the development. And I really do believe that tennis is uh, a team sport. It wasn't until I travelled from Melbourne, Australia, all the way to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, I know, who can believe it, uh, just outside of Nashville. For those of you who don't know, MTSU, I was a, a Blue Raider for college tennis. And one thing that, you know, I loved was playing for someone more than myself, which is, of course, the workplace. And this is, remember, a trait of what the champions have in common. They've got a great team around them. And if you look at some of the best players in the world, they've had that team for quite some time. So it's not a high turnover of coaches. Um, some players, yes, but the majority of the ones who've been the most successful because they have trust. Another word that's so important in coaching so important in building this new workforce. And in the corporate world, if we think about how does that relate, team connection. So in other words, do I believe that teams within my team and the teams within my organisation work well together? Do I trust my team leader, my team members? And make no mistake about it, you have to create the space. You have to potentially make meetings optional. Maybe like I mentioned earlier, it's a walking meeting or informal opportunities to connect. I did run a dating business once. Chapter one, doubles for singles. I got two marriages out of it, but only one is still together. But it was all about creating that sense of team connection through great questioning skills. You weren't allowed to ask, what do you do for a living? Uh, where do you live and what school did you go to? <laughs> so we banned those, those questions from the start. And instead, we asked really questions that go beyond the surface. So I also done a lot of things in the last 12 months with virtual team sort of informal catch-ups, little post-it notes. Um, never have I ever jumped out of an aeroplane. You just hold up the note. Uh, what virtual cooking classes. So people bringing in the, the culture, again, that work-life integration. So we're getting to know people on those sort of levels. It is possible to still create that team connection and we need to make sure that this happens. You have to create the space and the time for even curiosity conversations and create that culture of curiosity to help build that team connection. I wholeheartedly believe in that. And I think, again, it is going to be so important for the future. All right, so first person in the chat box, give me a summary of the five traits and see how fast your fingers can work to reel off and list those five traits as we get into section three of our webinar today.